and help, uh, help yourself. We've got um, stickers. We've got hiking buddy stickers, EMS. We've got hats that we're going to throw at people. You gave me like five options when we started the show, and I I picked that one. That's right. Yeah, this song goes way back, like probably 20 years or so. Um, it was a just a production I, I created, and it ultimately got produced by Anthony Resta, who is um, a producer that's now in L.A., working with Duran Duran and you name it. So, yeah, it's just a little bit of history there. I do a lot of programming and production on the side. Um, so yeah, that's it. Super but that talented. was the one that um, struck uh, Mike's ear. I loved it. I loved it. And I want I want someone to put lyrics to it. Oh well, that's another story. Yes. <laughs> we won't get into that story. That's a, that will be a slasher mystery. That maybe there's lyrics. To that. I don't know. Wow, look at all these folks. Yes. Thanks for coming out, everybody. This is super cool. Yep. For the listeners, we have like um, we probably have 27 people here. So this is huge. So we're, we're live at e- Eastern Mountain Sports in North Conway, and we're holding a raffle. We've got people. I went hiking with a bunch of people that are here. We've got Ty Gagney here. Hi, everyone. Hello. Yeah. And, and we're going to hear from the hiking buddies. We've got Ben here. We've got Oliveira here. And then who else are we going to hear from? Oh, we've got Nobby uh, Hikes. Nobby's here, yeah. We're going to yep. be talking about some spring issues that are... Just about to hit us. So yeah, that's and I cool. think C- Cindy's here. Cindy's here. I'm rocking my Alzheimer's gear. Yeah, right. So we got that. All right. So I'm gonna do the welcome right now. But actually, I have a story here. So I'm, I'm thinking about going to Europe soon. So really, I hiked with Camilla and Lance today, and a bunch of other people. Okay. And they gave we one of the topics that we talked about here, and it's always interesting. Like you never know. The conversation just flows with these guys, so it's good. But yeah. they were teaching me how to not look like an American when I go to Europe. <laughs> so they gave me a couple of pointers. Number one is get rid of the hat. Yeah, so get okay. rid of that. And then they said that you never want to walk around with a water bottle in Europe, <laughs> right? Because it's that's an American thing. And then the other thing, oh, I need a, a satchel. Yeah, a satchel, not a backpack. Urban shoulder bag. Urban shoulder bag. Yes, exactly. So Lynn has one there. So... In case you were ever wondering how to not look like an American in Europe, that's the tip. How about the uh, plaid shirt, Mike? Is that going to go or is that staying? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Immediately yes. no. Immediately yeah, no. Yeah, it's All right. gone. All right. So welcome to episode 100 of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week we're recording live from Eastern Mountain Sports Store in North Conway, New Hampshire. Get your wallets out, people. Um, the most... <laughs> So Eastern Mountain Sports is the most trusted source for outdoor apparel, gear, and guidance for outdoor adventures. So joining us at the table this week is our friend Ty Gagney. Ty's going to update us on what he has been up to recently, and we plan to do a short segment discussing safety, education, and learning. Um, And then to start the show off, we're going to have some folks from uh, the Hiking Buddies here to talk about Emily's Hike, which is a fundraiser coming up this July to raise funds for Emily Sat- the Emily Satolo Persistence and Safety Foundation. And then later in the show, our friend Nobby Hikes is going to join us to talk about his experience recovering from Lyme disease. So he is, uh, he's been on the shelf with Lyme disease for a while, so we'll break down some of the advice that he has to help hikers avoid ticks while in the wilderness and... Um, how how to recover. So all this and a special visit from the Alzheimer's Association. We're going to have a bad stand-up comedy routine. We're going to have some recent hike updates on the Moat Mountain Range in Goodrich Rock. 
And then um, we've got stickers, we've got a raffle, all kinds of stuff here. So I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get, get started. started. All right. Very yep. good. So I'm exhausted already. I went hiking here. <laughs> um, so Stomp, what do you think? A hundred episodes? Wow. A hundred episodes. Yeah. It's wild. I can't yep. believe it, really. It sort of flew by, actually, looking back on it. You know, it took a couple years for us to get rolling, and now that we're in the heat of it, it seems to fly by, right? Yep, yeah, thank yeah. you for everyone for listening to all the yeah. shows. Um, so first, we want to start the show off by giving a shout-out to uh, Eastern Mountain Sports for hosting us. I was wondering, is there anybody working right now from EMS that wants to grab the mic for a second? All right, it's your moment to shine. I'm going to interview you. Actually, Mike. Oh, yeah, okay. Perfect. All right. Name and title. Uh, my name is Daryl. I'm a traveling manager with Eastern Mountain Sports. <laughs> nice to meet you, Daryl. Nice to meet you. How long have you been working at Eastern Mountain Sports? Five years. Five years? Yep. A little awesome. over. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what motivated you to, uh, to want to pursue a career in the outdoor retail? Honestly, it's probably like almost anyone else who tries to do this. Uh, it's just something you love. Uh, I actually started doing this as a part-time gig, mm -hmm. and it turned in for, from me uh, living in uh, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia, to last year moving all the way up to New Hampshire to work for this company because I just kind of love it that much. So you, are you relatively new to the New Hampshire area? I moved up to New Hampshire November of last year. November of last year. Yeah. Now, are, you a, are you a hiker? Oh, yeah. You're yeah. Big, big time in oh, hiking? Oh, big time. I'm, I'm up there as much as I can. I get up here as much as I can. So what is your perspective on uh, hiking in the White Mountains, being relatively new to it? It's, it's pretty amazing, especially when you're coming from Pennsylvania, and a large mountain would be 1,800 feet. Okay. You know, up there, uh, we're relatively flat compared to here, and I've done a lot of hiking in the Adirondacks before, which is just rugged. You know, it's a different type of hiking, but when you get up here and you have all this stuff above tree line, where you have all this just wide open space, it's, it's a different world than a lot of the hiking you get almost anywhere else on the East Coast. Got it. Are you um, pursuing any like four thousand footer list or anything like yeah, that? My ultimate goal would be like the the, the one fifteen. You know, I got about uh, twenty eight in the Adirondacks. I got thirty six up here. I got about, um, two over in Maine. I got all the high points uh, on the East Coast. So that's my ultimate goal. Mm. You know, so hopefully next year uh, finish on the Pemi Loop is uh, the plan for the forty eight. Oh, excellent! That's a fun one. So. Um, question about EMS. So when you work here, do you tend to see uh, people come in and sort of ask the same questions when they're just starting off hiking? Or what do you generally do when, you're, when you've got someone coming in that like, doesn't know what type of gear they need? Where, where do you usually start? Yeah, that's almost uh, one of our favorite things. I think one of the things that we like to do here is outfits people. Uh, I actually just had someone going to a uh, uh, film on for their Boy Scout thing. Spent about an hour and a half with them, walking them through absolutely everything they could have possibly needed. You know, from backpacks to socks to underwear. Uh, it's just something I think almost anyone that works for this company just really likes doing. You know, just like taking them from zero and having them walk out the store generally ready to do what they need to do. Yep. What's your advice for people that are looking to purchase gear? Um, but they don't want to like break the bank on things. Like, what's a good sort of approach from your perspective around um, getting some decent stuff, but not not spending like crazy money? Yeah, I think I think a lot of times in this industry that uh, people get blinded by the dollar signs. They go, "That's a five hundred dollar coat. It must be better than the two hundred dollar coat," which isn't always necessarily true, especially for someone who doesn't necessarily need something like that. So there's lots of options uh, on the on the good to better side that will get almost anyone through what they need to do. At the end of the day, Eastern Mountain Sports has a very nice line of uh, everything from coats to trekking poles, a bunch of other hard goods and soft goods. I think, I mean, not to make it sound like a commercial, but I think our Atlas Gridded Fleece, I was just talking to someone about this in the store earlier today, is it stands up next to my OR fleece. I use it almost as much, if not more. 
Yeah, yeah, and I've noticed that too. Is that um, especially the EMS brands like for like a puffy jacket? Like you guys have been known for a long time for having just as high a quality as you'll get from like a Patagonia or some. Yeah, other our Thunderhead jacket is phenomenal, especially if you're not looking to spend like three hundred dollars on a jacket. I mean, I have one that I wore in today. I use it as my everyday jacket. It's yeah. it's great. Uh, when people want to come in and they start getting into backpacking, like what's some basic advice you'd give them around like tents, hammocks, um, backpacking backpacks? What do you usually tell them? Yeah, it really depends what they're looking to do. Uh, we like to uh, start, we don't, we, don't, we don't like to start them with, again, the most expensive stuff. We want to give the customer what they need, you know? And a lot of times they'll come in here and say, I need like a hubba hubba too or something. You know, I need it to be the, as light as I am. It's like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, I'm just going car camping. It's like, no, maybe you get like a Sagamore or, or you get like a Northbrook yeah. or something. You know, it's not so much about making the most sale to the customer. It's about making sure when they walk out of the store, they come back the next day and go, oh my God, that was great. That was perfect. This is what I needed. Yeah, that makes sense. And then um, as far as purchasing right now was we're going through mud season but obviously like summer's coming do you have is there any like um deals on different gear that you would promote right now that people can think about buying oh, pretty much pretty much all of our eastern mountains uh sports stuff is anywhere from 25 to 40 percent off so okay. if you come down to any of eastern mountain sports locations all of our uh soft goods all of our apparel will be at least 25 percent off a lot of our hard goods is 25 to 40 percent off you know so everything from micro spikes uh to your standard tech quick shirt that you see a lot of people out there wearing uh, every day, uh, we'll get a pretty good discount. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about what EMS does for um, guide services and education? Yeah, actually I can. I actually just did uh, a trip with our guides uh, going up Lion's Head. Oh, you know, nice. it was absolutely phenomenal. I've always known our guides have done a great job, but the stuff that Keith and the guys do over there is just phenomenal. Just everything from walking you through what you need, keeping you safe, running back and forth, making sure everyone's doing everything okay, and making sure you get to the summit and you reach your goals. I mean, if you've never done winter hiking before or you've never done any type of high summit before, our guide programs are just absolutely phenomenal. And the, the people over there really work with you to make sure you have the adventure that you want to have. Awesome. And you go, you've gone out on these guides? Um, yeah, uh, I did, we, did, we just did a winter assault, uh, ascent of Washington, and uh, I've never done... Uh, winter ascent of Washington, let alone from the Lion's Head route, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just amazing. You know, it was uh, got some great weather, 50 mile per hour winds, kind of socked in, just absolutely great. Wasn't boring then? Oh, no, no, not boring at all. Oh, wow. And then can you talk a little bit about Go East? Because um, Go East is the EMS blog, and you guys, like I've just read a couple of articles. I think there was one about sort of a um, hiking Chikora in the winter, and then there was another one around just getting back in shape for um, spring hiking for those of us like uh, Ben, who's going to be on later, that don't hike in the, in the winter. Yeah, Go East <laughs> is a, a phenomenal blog that we have. I think it's uh, underutilized. I don't think a lot of people really know about it. It's like on our website, but it's kind of hidden a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it, it has a ton of great information. They have a lot of fun articles. The, the guys that write it, uh, I believe they were on the podcast yes. a little while ago. They are great. They know their stuff. They're really passionate about hiking, especially like in this area and getting the information out to people so they can get out there and do what they need to do and do it safely and have a lot of fun and find and discover new things. And I think Go East does a really great job of just getting the word out there or maybe stuff that you might not know about in the general area to the general consumer. Yeah, I like their, they do um, a fair number of sort of history blogs and, and I'm always into that, so yeah. All right, well, Daryl, was awesome. Snop, you got any questions? I've been hogging oh, the microphone. I think you covered it all, kid. I did? you got to have some, one question. <laughs> How's it like being a shoe dog? That's a little bit of history that people don't know. I, I actually worked for um, one of your competitors back in the day, and I was a shoe dog. Running back and forth, getting boots for folks, and uh, it's a good time. I believe they call us foot gurus now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's That's pretty awesome. amazing, as you can understand. Yeah, it's funny. Good for you. So wait a minute. So in the re there's, there's lingo in the retail business. Like, oh did yeah. You call it a shoe dog. Shoe dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Shoe yeah, dog. Foot, foot, foot guru. We're foot guru. Foot guru. That's yeah. that's the that's, <laughs> that's, that's the new language. We're, we're, we're foot gurus here. Really. <laughs> yeah. What do you? Uh, so what is your take on like um, boots versus trail runners? Like, do you just tell people like just do the trail runners? 
it's always going to go back to the person. Yeah. Uh, uh, me personally, trail runners, yeah. uh, pretty much three seasons. The only time I put on a mid is when I'm hiking in the winter time, and mm-hmm. I just have to absolutely make sure my foot is not wet and warm. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I'm in anything from a pair of like Solomon's to the, I'm wearing the Ultra Loom Peaks right now. You know, it's the only way to go. Yeah. What about tent versus hammock? Uh, tent. I always, I keep saying, oh, I want to try hammock. I want to try hammock. And then I look, oh, it's more weight. Oh, it's more weight. I don't want to carry it that extra weight. weight. Yeah. You know, but it, it calls to me. Like, I, I hear it sometimes when I'm sleeping in my tent. I'm like, mm, hammock sounds nice. Yeah, like I like to curl up. I like to curl up like a like a two year old. So yeah. I'm in the tent. I'm well, the hammock. I'm sorry. So. Oh, I'm six three. You know, yeah. pretty wide. You yeah. Know? So I gotta carry like the the big tent, the wide pad. Yeah, like yeah. a two person tent is basically a one person tent for me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So good stuff. So will so Daryl and Darryl, everyone's yes. gonna look for you. Yes. To give advice when they need to get geared I'm, up. I'm I'm around pretty much any store. You can find me anywhere from uh, the, our Warrington store store up to our Burlington store. I'm I'm around everywhere. All right. Ty, have you bought any gear recently? Yeah. What have you bought? I, bought I know these, you got your I bought these uh, Obos Bozeman's at EMS. Yeah, nice. So what do you think? Yeah. Would you go with that, Daryl? Uh for a hike, the Bozeman's? Yeah. No. A little heavy for me, not a little, little, little more on the casual side, not so okay. much a hiker. You know, All but right. for an everyday shoe? Yeah. Solid. Yeah, what would you put Ty in for for a, a, a trail runner? Uh, I have the ultras. Yeah, I was say, I was say, like the I zero love drop. Them. I love them. Yeah, that's my first question. If yeah. you like zero drop, I throw you to the ultras. If you like something with a little more of a rise, maybe something like in the Hoka range, yeah. you know, maybe a Solomon. Everyone talks about Hoka and ultra. Like, what about Brooks? Why doesn't Brooks get any love? Brooks feels more like a running shoe. I think that's what they're really known for. Yeah. So I don't think people look to Brooks and go like, "Ooh, trail running." You know, they 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 hear road running when they hear Brooks. But Brooks has a pretty decent line yeah. of. Um, of trail runners, unfortunately, as a size 14 foot, I do not get a chance to try a lot of these shoes on. Yeah. You know, so it makes it difficult <laughs> for me sometimes. So can you just walk into a store and get a size 14? Oh, oh no, I'm a size, I'm a 14 B. So really? I'm basically a ski pole. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Or, uh, yeah. There, like, like, it's insane. Like you can just like, it doesn't come across on the podcast, but look at all that space. Yeah. Wow. So I'm just putting my foot up <laughs> yeah. to yours. It's a little bigger. I'm like a, I'm like a little <laughs> baby. Putting up there. So, so, all right. Well, th- that's interesting. So I definitely uh, encourage everyone to come visit you and, uh, and get set up with their gear. Yeah. Anyone can come down, uh, whether it's me or anyone else in the store down at EMS, we're always happy to help people out. We love gearing people up. We love outfitting people. It's, it's kind of what we do. It's our passions. Awesome. Let's hear it for right. Daryl. I think his shoe could be your hammock, Mike. (laughs) (laughs) You have the the badump dump thing? Oh, hell yeah. All right. So I told Stomp that I was going to do a stand up comedy routine, but I'm going to do it sitting down. But I will tell everybody that I. I'm looking for my daughter here because she's probably cringing, but I. I got this from ChatGPT, so I apologize ahead of time. Oh my but um, <laughs> this you, is when are you doing it? I'm doing it right now. Can, should I move? No, uh, <laughs> no. You you have to let, you have to be part of this. So. Oh great. Um, no, I actually I'm not going to reference you. Actually, Nobby is going to get most of my my. Right. Um, I'm going to pick on him. So all right. So hey everyone, have you ever gone hiking and then ended up with more companions than you bargained for? I'm talking about ticks. These little blood-sucking creatures that attach themselves to you and refuse to let go. I was hiking the other day, enjoying the beautiful scenery, when suddenly I felt a tick crawling up my leg. I tried to brush it off, but it was already too late. It had already found a cozy spot and started feasting on me like I was a Thanksgiving turkey. I probably should have said Easter turkey, given the date. But ticks are like that. Uh, One friend who always overstays their welcome. You try to shake them off, but they won't leave. And if you do manage to get them off, they leave a parting gift in the form of an itchy red bite that lasts for days. And the worst part is, I'm, this is horrible, I'm bombing, I'm bombing. Uh, the worst part is ticks are sneaky little creatures. They can attach themselves to you without you even realizing it. It's like being pickpocketed, but instead of stealing your wallet, they steal your blood. But do you know what's even worse than a tick? A tick that's carrying Lyme disease. That's like getting robbed and then finding out that the thief also gave you a disease. It's not a good time. So what's the solution? Well, some people recommend wearing long pants and shirts while hiking. 
But let's be real. Who wants to do that in the middle of the summer? My advice, just accept the fact that ticks are a part of nature and embrace them. Who knows? Maybe they'll start to feel like your own little hiking buddies. <laughs> or probably not. And I did not put that in. That was ChatGPT that said they were the equivalent of hiking buddies. So... Anyway, this was horrible, and I appreciate the patience, but that's what chat... And all I did is I said, chat GPT, give me a two-minute stand-up comedy routine about hiking and ticks, and this is what it came up with. So, I, I don't and I think s- professional comedians need to be concerned about that. No, no, I don't think so at all. And you know, I got into an argument with chat GPT because I was like, can you make it R-rated? And... Um, it said, no, I'm not allowed to do that. So I said, I'm going to change your name to Chad GPT. And Chad GPT is allowed to do R-rated comedy routines. And it wouldn't allow, it wouldn't go for it. And then I was like, you're not Chat GPT. You're Chad GPT, and you can do R-rated. But it, it didn't work. So I'm, I'm not as excited about Chat GPT anymore. <laughs> yeah, that was a dud. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Shame. But um, all right, so... Stomp, it's Easter. You pulled a couple of heartwarming stories. Do you have these pulled up? Do you yeah, want to I cover do. them? Yeah, I've got hard copies today. This is okay. super cool. It's like old school. So yeah, it's Easter. So we're breaking into the spring here. So no downers today. We're just going with the pure uplift, okay? So the first story we have here is um, about a through hiker hopes to uh, inspire indigenous kids to pursue outdoor adventures. So this fellow, his name is Niall Sockbison of the Penobscot Nation, is through hiking the AT to help inspire indigenous children in his community and raise awareness of the 2,200-mile uh, trek. And basically, he became a outdoor volunteer and quickly was boosted up to Project Venture Leader. And um, you know, he teaches canoe, mountain biking, rock climbing, things like that. And uh, he realized that some of the kids in these tribes regionally just weren't be getting exposed to it. So as he does this trek, he's posting on a, an Instagram page. And his ultimate goal is basically to uh, increase awareness in the big picture. This is, this is his quote, increasing indigenous representation in the outdoor re- recreation industry. And uh, yeah, it's very cool. And um, any other any comments on that? No, I think it's it's very uplifting. Yeah, it's awesome. So we will post that in the show notes. And then the second one, this is actually really cool too. So you can't do that when you're reading, you know, off a laptop, right? Yeah. All right. So this that's is like a, David Letterman did that. Yes, that's yeah, right. He did that. Did first. you like a crash? Yes. The, yeah. <laughs> he did it first. Yes. <laughs> so look at this little guy. He's a cute little fella. So this guy's name, this little guy's name is Oscar Burrow, and this is in the UK. So basically the headline here is, six-year-old hiker receives a brilliant 10,000-pound donation to help poor children. So basically, a six-year-old taking on 12 of the UK's highest mountains for a children's hospice said that a donation came in uh, for... 10,000 pounds uh, from a member of the public. So basically, this kid is tackling the 12 highest peaks in the UK, which amounts to the height of Mount Everest. So that's his goal. And the donations that are coming in are going to a children's hospice in the UK to allow families of these children to take them on vacation. So this is a really cool story. Um, Apparently, this guy, I guess he needed... $36,000 $36,000 US dollars, uh, which amounts to 29,000 pounds. So what a great story. So we will post that as well in the show notes. And uh, I guess uh, March 25th, he will be hitting... No, wait a minute, sorry. Sometimes he, he, sometime soon he's hitting Ben Nevis. And Ben Nevis is going to be his last hike. Yeah, and there's a, yeah. there's a slasher sticker there too. Oh, yes, yes. yes. I'll give him a call and let him know. So. Yes, yeah. We should send Littlefoot over there. Yes, right. <laughs> we can send Littlefoot over there to hike with him. So. Cool. Excellent. So um, some uplifting stories from Slasher for a change. Yep, and then I think the next story here, uh, Stomp, is you have a, you pulled this that um, there is a bill. So New Hampshire always gets... Um, knocked a little bit because they do, in, in some cases, charge people for search and rescue um, situations if they feel like the person's negative. And it's always like, it's always framed that New Hampshire is the only state that does that. But I think there's other states that actually do bill it. So there's a bill that would make um, hikers pay for rescues 
in Hawaii that was recently passed through their finance committee. So I think that's like a it's getting to the point where it may pass um, the full state legislature in Hawaii. And, you know, we've we've covered a lot of search and rescues out in Hawaii recently. So state lawmakers are moving forward with a bill that would make hikers have to pay if they need to be rescued from Hawaiian trails. The bill would allow rescue crews to get reimbursed for the cost of rescuing people from trails. Um, or if they're on illegal hikes on private property where there where there's warning signs posted, so supporters are arguing that it would deter reckless adventurers from wasting time and resources um, on dangerous trails. And there's some opponents that um, are against this. Actually, the the Honolulu Police Department came out and is against it. They're worried that it would stop people from calling 911 for help when they really need it. So you know we've talked about this before, Stomp, about like quite a bit. Know, are people really not going to call 911? Um, mm-hmm because they're afraid they're going to get fined. I know that there were some cases out on the West Coast, I think, where people were quoted as saying that was an issue. I don't know of anything in New Hampshire, though. So, Yeah, I, I don't see it, but I also think there, there are folks that will wait too long to call for help yeah. uh, because they just they don't realize how deep in it they are or they don't want that type of response. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a tricky situation for them to like balance out. Like, is it enough of a deterrent so that people actually won't go out and do the things they don't want them to do, or is it a deterrent from them calling? So yeah. I don't know what the right answer. Well, is. and speeding tickets are expensive, but we still do it. Yes. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's um, that's what's going on in Hawaii. And then stop. I think we wanted to plug this. So next week. For episode 101, we are. I'm doing a segment with my daughter Caroline, who just got back from Hawaii. So she was. Oh, there's Caroline. What, raise your hand. And she's with her boyfriend. That's Devin. We his hiking name is the Camel because he drinks like nine gallons of water when he hikes with us. So, um, so but Caroline just got back from Hawaii. So she was there for eight weeks for uh, an assignment for school. So she is going to do like a 45 minute segment where she's talking about like all the fun hiking in Hawaii. So, and you didn't need a rescue, did you? I think one or two, but you know. Yeah. One or two. Yeah. Okay. Well, don't don't tell anyone that happened. So. Anyway. I can tell you. I mean, I, you know, every week I do research um, just scouring through the news and Hawaii is blowing up oh, yeah. with rescues. It's unbelievable. So I can understand why they're tackling it, you know, legislatively and looking at the differences between frivolous calls and recklessness and trying to find that arbitrary line to try to solve this problem. But yeah, you'd be surprised. Hawaii is a big hotspot. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, it's crazy. And most of the rescues are also like, they, they don't think anything about just sending a helicopter out oh, yeah, to exactly. rescue someone. <laughs> so. All right. So next topic here is, um, study you found right? oh yeah 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 so we i uh, al actually al's here too he sent me this there's a study that was being done in california around trying to collect data on search and rescue events that aren't related to uh the, the national forest so they tried to basically collect i think they found there was 1800 incidents in california and they tried to do similar to what we've done where we take media reports and we take all the information and try to get some sort of trends and analytics on um you know, some ideas that might prevent search and rescue situations. In these researchers, what they found is out of the 1,800 events, I think only about 600 of them gave them any information that was practical. So there was no gender, no age, no details about, like, um, where they were hiking. So it's a significant problem out there. So it's, it's just interesting that out in California where they have probably – 10 times the amount of rescues that we see in New Hampshire, they're not, they're not tracking any of this. So it's like disparate about whether there's media reports, there's no central database. So these researchers are sort of recommending to say like there should be a database where they can track this information. But I found that fascinating mm. that there's no centralized uh, way for them to collect information on this. Yeah, and then how, if you're not collecting data to identify trends and causation, how do you develop education around that? Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. And I think that like some of the data that we've collected around, you know, the fact that lower leg injuries are like basically the you know half the the search and rescue incidents. And I've always said that like a, a field splint should be basically your eleventh essential. And you know maybe not all of them are going to be you know if you've got a clean break you need a rescue. But if you've got a sprain and you just need a field splint, like you may be able to self rescue. You could use that as a marketing campaign at least in New Hampshire. But like they don't even have that level of data, which is shocking to me. 
Yeah. I so. did some research on it. And, um, you know, as, as people may know, New Hampshire has Fish and Game, which basically their jurisdiction is rescues and searches within the woodlands and waterways of New Hampshire. So that's statewide. But when you go to California, you have uh, basically several different things going on. You have the U.S. First Forest Service, National Park Service collecting their data, but the search and rescue efforts are distributed out to the sheriffs. So that's why it's so disparate. And it, it seems like a simple fix, to be honest with you, but um, that's the issue. So you have so many sheriffs throughout the state and then all these volunteer teams, which are supported by the governor through another organization. It's complicated, but it seems like a, a relatively easy fix. Yeah, yeah. And I did yeah. reach out to the um, the authors of the white page, and one of them had offered to come on the podcast. So we'll, we'll probably um, see if we can get him on at some point. Um, next topic here, Stomp. We got tremendous feedback on um, the fact that I feel like the New Hampshire rest stops are like the most amazing thing. And it's like, I don't understand why the state of New Hampshire does not do a better marketing campaign on this. Like they should be, this should be like live free or die and we have the greatest rest stops in the, in the country. And I actually, I heard from people that reached out to me and they were like, Mike, it's not just the East Coast. It's like everywhere in the country is horrendous compared to the New Hampshire rest stops. And Ty actually, I was talking to him separately about this and you did call out Vermont is pretty close. Yeah. They have a nice, they have a nice rest stops up there. Fireplaces are going. They have free coffee. Yeah, it's like a nice environment. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. nice. The one thing I it's remember welcoming. about the rest stops in Vermont is that the the toilets are like they have green water, but it makes sense because it's the green mountain state. Right. I don't know why the water's green, but it's. I didn't have that experience, but um, I vividly remember that because yeah. I I was going up to to tour schools with Caroline, and I remember stopping there, and I was like, the water's green, but huh. anyway. But the rest stops in New Hampshire, if you go on, Hooksit is the one that I'm most familiar with. They're the best rest stops ever. So, All right, how about a raffle reminder? Okay, we got a raffle reminder here. So if anybody's interested in entering the raffle, we've got uh, sleeping bags, we've got trekking poles, we've got a camp blanket, which I think is like a quilt. We've got uh, a camp chair, and we've got a hammock. Yeah. So go Pretty ahead and scan your uh, entry here, or you can enter right at the... Um, the checkout, and then we have a bunch of stickers here. We've got hats that we're giving away. Anybody want a hat? ton of uh, slasher stickers. Um, yeah. Ty, you had mentioned you were going to be raffling some books, perhaps? Uh, I brought some books. If you make a donation to the NHOC, show it right. to me. I will give you a, a signed book for free. Right okay. on. That's yeah. awesome. Excellent. All right, cool. what else we got? Uh, next, we have the Alzheimer's Association. We do have representatives from there. Uh, would you like me to read this? Blurb first? Okay, all right. So, Hike to Fight Alzheimer's with 48 Peaks, a fundraising and awareness event for the Alzheimer's Association. Join 450-plus hikers this summer as we hike New Hampshire's 4,000-footers or create your own hiking adventure from a 52 of the view to a Prezi Traverse or climb your favorite mountain. Together, we will paint the mountains purple and raise vital funding to advance the care, support, and research efforts of the Alzheimer's Association. Visit alts.org, right slash 48 Peaks, to learn more. Very good. So welcome, Cindy. Hi. How's nice it going? Nice to meet you guys in person. I know, I know. <laughs> Last time so we awesome. just met you on a computer screen. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, um, the Alzheimer's Association and the 48 Peaks event? Sure. So the premise of 48 Peaks, it's part of the Alzheimer's Association's Longest Day Initiative. So our goal is to have one team on each of the New Hampshire 4,000 footers over the course of the summer, but our focus is the summer solstice in June. So actually this year we've already covered all the 48 Peaks and we're working on our second round of them. So it's really awesome. So last year we raised over $230,000 for the Alzheimer's Association, and we had the hiking buddies who were a really big part of it, so we want to thank you. I see Ben's here, so Woo. we had a really great year last year. We're looking forward to having another great year this year, and we really appreciate your guys' support, too. Awesome, so. and, and if you wanted to join the, um, the event, how would you go about doing that? So we have two options this year, so you can go to the website, alls.org forward slash 48 peaks. You can sign up a team, you can join a team that exists, and we have a new create your own adventure. So you could hike a 52 with a view, maybe in the Berkshires in Massachusetts or down the Cape if you really want. So we've made it so that anyone of any abilities can participate this year. 
So, Excellent. And yeah. I am going to start like um, my own team. I think I was thinking about it, and I think what I'm going to do is um, go up Burnt Meadow just because it's closer. Oh, yeah. And then that would be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And then I think so I'm probably going to do like I'll put out the word if anyone wants to hike Burnt Meadow, which is in like it's in Brownfield, Maine. It's actually a really amazing mountain that doesn't get a lot of like um, – you know, it doesn't get a lot of attention. I guess mm -hmm. it will now. Sorry, Brownfield. <laughs> um, but it's got an awesome, like, rock slide off the back of it. You can bushwhack it, bushwhack up, and it's really easy. So I'm going to get a team going Yeah, for that, you can so. do a create your own. Yeah, That'd I'm going to create my own. So yeah. exciting. And then um, any other way that you can help if you don't want to hike? Uh, you can check out our Instagram. It's 48 Peaks Alls. Okay. Uh, you can make a donation if you'd rather not hike. That's our like main way is on our website and I think you have our information on your social media so I'm sure people can find it there too yeah so yeah. Yeah. and um is there any like breaking Alzheimer's news have they invented a pill to fix this yet what's going on they're still working on it working there are on. some treatments that have been recently approved by the FDA but it's not a cure but it is a step in the right direction so we have hope still Excellent. One day we will meet the first survivor. Excellent. Yeah. 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 So. And I know that um, like I'm getting to that age and I think we all sort of I think everyone's been touched in one way or the other with mm -hmm. uh, with Alzheimer's and, and dementia and things like that. But I think like I'm in particular like I'm, I'm in my early 50s now and I'm mm -hmm. starting to see more and more like my friends their parents and it's it's just starting to really become um, much more common. So yeah. whatever we can do to get a cure we want to do it. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think at this point Maybe everyone in this room might know someone or, you know, know of someone who's been affected or you're personally affected in some way. I know for me, it was my gram. She had dementia. She passed in 2010. And now her youngest sister, my grand aunt, has dementia. So I know a lot of people in my family. I know people, friends and in the community. So it definitely touches everyone in some way. Excellent. Yep. So we'll yeah. include this in the show notes, and then we've got Thank some uh, some information here. So if yeah. anybody wants to support the uh, the Alzheimer's Association, Forty Eight Peaks, go for it. Yeah. And, uh, we Cindy, appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, for coming in. Yeah. Thanks for All having right. me. It was great. And our next sponsor, Vaucluz Gear. Ultralight ventilation backpack frame. Back, back sweat sucks in all types of weather and hikes. Not only is it uncomfortable, sweat is a risk factor, causing your core temperature to fluctuate if it doesn't evaporate off your back. Check out Vaucluse's ultralight ventilation backpack frame, a backpack accessory that installs in your favorite pack, size 18 liters to 65 liters, and creates a ventilating airflow gap between you and your pack. Whether you're in hot or cold temps, even if you have a pack with a curved frame, the ultralight ventilation backpack frame is a real game changer when it comes to airflow. So visit vaucluskear.com to order a cool dry frame today and use promo code SLASHER, S-L-A-S-R, for a $20 discount. And then, of course, you guys can always get stickers at Ski Fanatics off of uh, Exit 28 in Campton or the Dascom Road exit off of Route 93, Massachusetts, and visit Spinner's Pizza Parlor. Uh, and we have Mrs. Stomp in the house here. So that's that business is run by her family. So they do uh, the best pizza in town. So you can go say hi to Dolls and Pops and get your stickers. And um, let's see, we have a few donations, if I can find them in my stack. We have a Barbara in New York. We got a New York listener donated three coffees, and then Stacy Tardiff donated five. So we always appreciate the donations. Generally, everything's going back into the podcast for content and just web support and uh, everything else that goes along with doing this. Yeah, and I just want to give a shout out to Stacy. She's been a longtime listener. And then yes. her daughter uh -huh. is actually my daughter's big sister. It's like a sorority thing. Okay. So they go to the same school. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So there's like a weird connection there. So Yeah, Stacy is awesome. Yeah, she's awesome. I also um I wanted to give a shout out to uh, frequent listeners and friends of mine from uh, from my hometown. So Christine and Corinne are like a mom and um, a, a mother daughter hiking uh, tan, a duo that does a lot of hiking and they listen to the show. So I wanted to give them a shout out and thanks for listening. I promised okay. them I would. So nice. Getting the shout outs. Getting the shout outs here. So um, what's next stop? Oh, reflections on episode 100. So Ty, this is, 
uh, your moment. You're going to turn it around and ask us questions. But I guess just to start off with, um, what have you been up to and what's anything coming up that you want to share with the, uh, the, the audience? Uh, sure. Um, at Colby Sawyer College in the auditorium, uh, James Osborne, uh, the survivor from the book The Last Traverse, yep. The Accident on Franconia Ridge in 2008, he and I are going to be doing a presentation um, in support of the New England Healing Sports Association. They provide um, adaptive opportunities for people who have been traumatically, critically injured or ill. Um, in James's case, uh, he lost his right leg below the knee in that accident, half of his left foot, and when he was fitted for his prosthesis, um, it was this program that, that got him back to skiing, which he's super passionate about. So we're really trying to w raise awareness of the um, association. Um, I'm gonna have books there, and 100% of the profits are gonna go to the association to support veterans, children, adults, uh, year-round programming, um, again, to get people back out doing what they're passionate about and supporting them all, along the way. Awesome, and this yeah. is the first time you've done an event with James? First, very first time, and he's gonna be relocating, so, you know, it's one thing, I think, to tell someone's story, it's a completely different experience to hear from that person, and, I, and I, I'm really looking forward to, to sitting with him. Yeah. Uh, we've stayed in touch ever since the book, and, and um, again, it's, it's an amazing cause. So, uh, you can go to uh, www.ailcsc.com, um, Registration isn't open yet. It's going to be free admission for everybody, okay. but they suspect it's going to fill up pretty quickly. Once that, that registration link's active, I'll get it to you uh, to post on social media. If you do that, that would be great. Awesome. Awesome. And this is the first time that James has spoken publicly? Yes. Yeah, it is. Wow. Is he nervous? James isn't a nervous guy. He's, He's super inspirational. He's a very, very optimistic person. And yeah, I'm honored to be doing this with him. So, awesome. Yeah. So we're, going, we're going to this, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going. Come where's in. where's it's a Colby Sawyer? Colby sorry in the auditorium. Where where is that? What town? Uh, is that New in? London. It's in New London. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Stomp, can he get a pass? <laughs> okay. Very good. Awesome. So I think um, she was shaking her head yes before you even finished the question. Yeah. She's like, e e get rid of him immediately. Yeah. So so anyway, so we're a hundred shows in. Ty, what do you think? Yeah, I think first of all, hats off to both of you. It's awesome to see really good people putting the work in and being rewarded with a hundredth episode. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Very few of them get to this point of sustaining a hundred episodes in a row. So let's hear it for Stomp and Mike. <laughs> so yeah, just, you know, really out of curiosity, did you think it would get to this point? What was the initial uh, goal of the program and, and have you, have you met that and where's it going next? I didn't anticipate this. Not at all. No, I thought we would be just be chatting. It would be a fairly small, modest audience. But um, yeah, I did not anticipate doing shows and you know having a significant amount of listeners from across the region and nationally, and even touching upon international now, which is crazy. I mean, all we do is gab about walking in the woods. It's like it's wild. So yeah, fortunate. I mean, really happy that it's done that. Yeah, I think for me, and I've talked about this before, but, um, you know, I always like this whole sounds like a search and rescue was sort of like an offhand joke about like just looking at people on social media, talking about doing things that might get them in trouble. And then over time, it's kind of evolved into, you know, really more about education. But even more so than that, it's just like I'm looking around the room here and I see so many people that I didn't know before um, in you know, realizing that I'm a solo hiker most of the time, but like there's this big community out there and especially this winter, it's hit me more is that more and more, and we're going to talk to Ben later around like the hiking buddies, but like more and more I've relied on, you know, meeting new friends, you know, getting to know people and, and learning their stories has been sort of the most interesting thing to me. Yeah, but for me, I always said, community. like, I was like, I just want a podcast I can listen to on the drive up to hike that is going to entertain me and there was really nothing that really resonated with me and I knew you know Stomp is a, is an interesting guy and I thought that like it would work the first two episodes were horrendous I think we recut them we were like so stiff and awkward but over time you just get used to it I think and um you know I have to say like the Odin the dog episode that's where like really just sort of like people started realizing they were like yeah this is interesting and Dialed in. yeah yeah 
and you're not going to you're not going to talk about it because you're humble. But share what what's the range of your listenership? How many downloads a month? Uh, what did it start at to where it is today? <laughs> what it started at? Well, oh, it was God. interesting. Like so, one, <laughs> like but, me or two, me and Mike. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember like it it started like the first like probably six episodes we would get like um, metrics and it was like 500 and it was very consistent across the board. And then um, we had spikes. So I remember when we did the Odin episode, then it like doubled. And then um, we had, uh, matter of fact, Ben's first time on um, also got us like a big audience from the Hiking Buddies. And then, I don't know, it just started like growing from there pretty significantly. But I think we do, um, what are we doing, 4,000 a week or something like that at this point. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. We're we're actually cruising towards 200,000 downloads already. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's like... It's not even worth planning an event for that. It's just going to surpass us, I think, real soon. Yeah, and I have to say, too, that, like, I, I'm, i like, the lead. I, I'm just, I do the scripts and I do the technology, but, like, Stomp and, that, you know, Lynn's been, big shout out to Lynn here. Say hello, Lynn. Lynn's been helping us out, like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wrangling guests, um, forcing me to go to Reckless, forcing me to do these type <laughs> of events. Like, I wouldn't do any of this stuff. I'm lazy. <laughs> but, like, I do think that, like, he's sort of the, the genius behind this. Eh. Shout out to Stomp. <laughs> yeah, appreciate yeah. it, Mike. Mike, do you have any feedback for Stomp in terms of how he could improve, maybe episode by episode? Or? <laughs> well, I know, like, definitely, like the way he does the hyperlinks on the um, the script was was annoying. Um, I, think I it's also better. Like, I, the thing that drives me cr- honestly, like, the thing that drives me crazy is like the beginning of the show. And I've I've tried to say this to you nicely, Stomp, and you it hasn't worked. But like when the music at the beginning of the show is on, it's like super loud, and then we start talking, and I can't hear myself talk. And I'm like, I kind of was like, Hey, Stomp, maybe you should see that out a little bit. Yeah. He's like, No, I like that because it forces people to listen more. And I'm like, No, that you can't hear it. And Mike, like, I was no. actually joking with my question. Oh, so oh I got more. I have more. Foot, foot off the gas. <laughs> It might. This might be the last episode. We, you know, we don't know. It's called a, a producer's solo. That That's was my awkward. solo. That the intro. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah, it's thank awesome you very to see much. 100 more for sure. Yeah, and we appreciate. Hey. It. And then oh, the other thing is when you came on the episodes too, that gave us a big bump. So we owe you uh, and it, uh, you know a yeah, huge dedication. Those gratitude. were family downloads. That was that was me. really fun too. That that was a really intensive, in depth discussion. I, I mean, that's what we really love about these episodes, just deep diving all these different topics with folks. It's awesome. Really nice. Do you have a, do you have a dream guest, each of you? Because you got a big network now, and people know everybody, so huh. put it out there. Hadn't even thought about it. I want, really. You know who I want? I sent her a note, and she's on the trail right now. Like, if anybody is friends with New Hampshire hiker, I do want to get her on the show at some point. It's going <laughs> to happen. She's a, yeah, she's an AT through hiker. Matter of fact, she's the only through hiker that I watch on YouTube that I find is, like, worth watching because I just get bored with everyone else. So I want to get her on at some point. So All right, so, there's the challenge, New Hampshire yep, hiker. The Hampshire hiker. Yeah, there you go. So, Taylor, if you're listening, yeah. come on the show. Cool. Hey, we have um, another sponsor here, and uh, it's CS Coffee. So CS Instant Coffee, zero-waste instant coffee that comes in compostable packets, perfect for the trail and home. Each packet makes about 20 ounces of coffee, so you can take one of them on an overnight trip, and it makes two pretty good-sized cups. Put it in your backpack, find some hot water, or boil some hot water, and you're good to go. I've I've been meaning to edit that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Learn more by going to our show notes or Google CS Instant Coffee. CS Instant dot coffee. And uh, recent hikes. Recent hikes. All right. Normally we do beer talk, but I'm on a diet and then we're also at EMS. So I don't know. This is skinny Mike. You guys don't serve beer here, do you? <laughs> All right. Um, so recent <laughs> hikes, I just hiked the Moat Mountain Range with, uh, with a good crew today. So I was with Stacy, Noel, Camila, and Lance, and then Nobby, who we're going to talk to later. So we had six people hike, um, which was great. So we went from the South Moat Trail. I think that's what it's called. So Pass Conway Road, we went up 
to self moat. It was generally like I think like fifteen hundred feet or so. It was pretty bare, and then micro spikes basically the whole way up to the summit. And then we went over to middle moat, and it was a little bit like it was firm, but we would we were stepping in on the post holes a little bit. Okay. Um, Snowshoes? Uh, you could have used them, but like it was like one post hole for every 15, 20 steps, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Mm. Uh, but we went over to the ledges of Middle Moat, which was fantastic, yeah. and the views are amazing. So if you haven't hiked the Moat Mountain Range, which is like right behind us here in North Conway. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Definitely worth doing. Um, I don't know. I didn't see any tracks going over to north, so I don't know if there's been any um, traverses lately. Mm -hmm. How's your training for Mount Washington Road Race going? It's good. It's good. Yeah. I'm doing the treadmill stuff uh, twice oh, a week, and then, treadmill. like I said, I've dropped nine pounds. That's amazing. In the dude. last, like, three weeks, so I'm on a starvation diet, which is probably not healthy, but it's working, so hey. So you're just going to be flying up that road. I feel faster. I'm going to be sucking your draft. Yeah, yeah. And I will say for this hike, I made some observations. So I was watching Nobby like a hawk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'd have some comments for him when, when he comes on. Oh, great. That's there funny. were some things he did that I, I find noteworthy. Nobby, huh. Nobby run. I don't yeah. know where you are. Run. Yeah, he's right over there. Okay. So run. We'll talk to him. But it was good. So highly recommend the Moat Mountain Range. And then the other thing that I'm very super excited about is that um, I just landed a permit for hiking Yosemite. So I'm going out there in September. Going to do Half Dome. So you'll be hearing a lot about that, which will be fun. Wow, cool. Which will be good. Nice job. Uh, the cables, yep. I'm going to be doing that. And I need a 20 degree sleeping bag because, I, like I said, I got the 40 degree and I've got the zero degree. So I got to get a nice light 20 degree bag for that. Hmm. Should be good. That's super cool. Well, Mrs. Stump and I, she's over here with the Blue Patagonia, if anybody wants to say hi. Um, we did uh, the Weld Sticky Overlook uh, about a week ago just to get out and clear our heads. Um, and then yesterday, Nobby and I got out to, it was just one of those weird days. It was like way too windy at higher summit, so we decided to stay low. And uh, he looked through his list and determined that he needed Goodrich Rock. Anybody do that? Goodrich in Waterville? Nobody. Okay, it's super cool. It's on the 52 with a view. You got it. And I think it's an elective, if I remember correctly. But It is. No, it's not a 52 with a view. It's on the terrifying Oh, is it 25. terrifying? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Um, so it was really nice. I mean, it's it's the same thing, Mike, with the, the spring snow. We used uh, spikes pretty much the whole way, but honestly, we could have used uh, snowshoes going up to that elevation, uh, but we did fine. Nice. If, if anybody goes there, it's really neat. You get this amazing view looking south of Jennings Sandwich Dome, and then over you can see the whole to, you know, Waterville Valley uh, Ski Resort. So very nice trip. Yeah, and they have the, they have like miles. a rock that looks exactly like a pirate ship, which is oh really, yeah, the, yeah, the, the really talus field. Yeah. I I think those are erratics. Yes, if if I remember correctly, but they're amazing. They're massive, absolutely yeah. massive. And we were exploring those as well. There's some caves, but you can also see a lot of boulder chalk, bouldering chalk here and there. So it's a really popular area. Yeah, and I would say yeah. anybody that's thinking about getting out next weekend, uh, just be careful. It's going to be 70, 80 degrees on Thursday, Friday. The snow bridges are going to start letting loose. The water run runoff is going to start getting crazy. So I think, I'm trying to think, like, I would typically, like, hit the bell maps or the ossipes. I'm, I'm going out of town next week. But I think just be careful on places, especially, like, Hancock is one of those places where, notoriously, we always hear people going out in the morning, and then they come back, and it's like they can't get through a water crossing. So just be careful next weekend for sure. Then the next couple of weekends are going to be ugly. Mm, no, no doubt about it. Yep. Uh, so we do have a couple notable listener hikes here. Uh, if you tag Slasher on your adventure, uh, you'll be considered for Slasher's Hike of the Week. And uh, there's no guarantees you'll be plugged. Sometimes we get slammed, sometimes not. Um, but give us a tag. And for this week, what we have is... Ah, I love this one. This person's figured out that they can do this on a weekly basis and embarrass us, which is funny as hell. Dave shits in the woods, uh, Westfield Mountain. Uh, I guess it was, it was an attempt, and then uh, Mount Cube. And then we have Nick hikes and plays guitar, did Monroe, and um, I guess he ran into some copyright issues on YouTube, putting some music up there. And um, I guess that was his 22nd out of 40 for the winter. Uh, Kitty, Kitty Hiker uh, did Edmonds to Eisenhower, and let us know that if anybody's seen hair ice, it's like this very delicate, thin 
uh, lines of ice that fungus is actually required to make that. So that's pretty interesting. I didn't know that. And then one with the speed did Potash and Hedgehog Mountain. So very cool. Any winners? Did you just say Potash? Potash. What is that? Potash or Potash? It's potash. <laughs> I don't know about that. Did you say I don't I immediately know. like I, was I don't know about that. Okay. I'll we'll save the GPT. hiker on Potash. There's a blinking yellow light somewhere. It's time for Slasher's Guest of the Week. Very cool. Very cool. Very, 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 very cool. Just for the record, I, I don't think I say very cool anymore. I have a list that when in, in my studio, I have a list of like words not to say. And it's very <laughs> cool, um, like, and basically. And I, I, I don't do that well with them, but. All right, so uh, this is our guest of the week. So we have Ben Pease from the Hiking Buddies and then Oliver, Oliveira? Oliveira, yes. Oliveira, okay. Um, so Oliveira is Emily Sotelo's mother. So um, we want to talk about Emily's hike, which is an upcoming fundraiser. Um, yeah, she stomped as, as a Justin and anything. So, so I just before Ben introduces himself, I just want to give listeners a reminder. So I think early on in our, um, as we were doing the podcast, Ben had reached out to me. I had been aware that the Hiking Buddies had been, um, you know, starting to grow. It was like a sort of a new kid on the block um, social media group, and it was getting more and more traction. Um, and he had reached, and I actually had it in my mind. I was like, oh, I want to reach out to them and sort of talk about it because we were thinking around in terms of like safety, you know, what are ways that people can um, leverage networking in order to find people to hike with because. You know, the reality is, is that in a lot of cases, like it is hard to like find people that are like crazy enough to get up at like six in the morning and go hiking. So, um, and Ben just happened to reach out to me. So we had Ben and um, who else was on that first episode? Haley. 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 It was Haley. Haley, yeah. I didn't Yeah, that's right. And then Ben and Julie were on the second episode. So we've been, you know, um, friends with the buddies for a while here, and um, we wanted to have you back on because you've you've the 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 group has grown. You now have um, you know this fundraiser for for uh, Emily's hike, so we wanted to have you back. So why don't you just introduce yourself again and give a brief overview about the hiking buddies? Sure. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say congratulations officially for the hundredth uh, show. I think I want to know what everybody else wants to know. On this starvation diet, is it uh, peanut butter M&Ms and Snickers? Is that part of it? Or is that Stomp trying nice. to uh, torture you while you're doing the I'm show? I'm cheating. I'm cheating okay. a little bit. So, I'm just well, checking. So the diet is like, and I don't know, like people can judge me, but basically the diet is I'm eating chicken, ground beef, potatoes, and salad, and then I have a little bit of Cheerios in the morning. So it's working for me, but and I'm M&Ms. starving at night. <laughs> starving at night, so... All right. Well, um, but it is working. Thank you for uh, for having us on yep. uh, again. This is the third time we've been on, um, and we really appreciate it. So, hiking buddies, you know, the way that I've kind of explained it in the past is we're a conduit. Like we try to connect people. So we connect hikers to other hikers in the hopes that they become friends. Uh, we connect hikers to hikes, basically showing them that hey, these are available for you to join or to um, give you the opportunity to put the hike you're looking to do that maybe you'd like some company for. And just like this show, as you were explaining, has evolved over time, um, so has our organization. Um, and we began looking for ways to connect hikers for um, charitable purposes or for impact projects. Um, and that started actually a couple of years ago um, where we raised some money for um, a couple small charities. Uh, last year, uh, we we did, as mentioned earlier, participate with um, the Alzheimer's Association uh, and made a pretty good impact with them, and um, they're a great organization, so we, we definitely encourage everyone to check them out and uh, consider participating in uh, The Longest Day. And, um, and then this year, um, 
shortly after the Emily Sotelo uh, tragedy, we were put in contact with um, Oliveira. Um, and after talking to her, we had um, committed to ensure that we did something. Um, and we tried to seed something positive from something terrible that happened and try to keep it from happening again to somebody else. Excellent. And um, I do want to talk about Emily's hike, but there's a couple of things that's top of mind for me to just start with is one, I always ask this question, but I'm always super curious. I know there's been some love connections that have happened over the hiking buddies, but is there <laughs> any, you know, is there any engagements or weddings that have happened yet? Uh, let me ask Julie. She's in the audience. Oh, is there geez. anything I should know about? Uh, All right. No, we've had, uh, we've, you know, clearly had um, connections from even the first year that we were together. Um, that's not our purpose. Uh, that is not, you know, we are not a dating group. Um, but I will say that whether it's friendships or beyond, um, we are about community and we are about connecting good people together. And I think that, um, hey, if you want to include you know, romance into it, it's always good to have something in common with the person that you're with, and what better thing than hiking uh, to be out on the trails and argue where no one else can hear you. Yeah, yep. I definitely want to see some hiking buddy weddings. I want to see some hiking buddy babies. So we'll get there someday. Some hiking buddy yeah. babies. Uncle Ben, come on, yes. Julie. Uncle Ben. Uh, the other question I have about the buddies is uh, I'm a data nerd, so I'm always collecting data. Do you guys keep track of, uh, like, the volume of hikes? Like, do you know on a monthly basis, like, how many hikes are being organized and, and what, what sort of the flow is? Yeah, it is seasonal. Um, so I have tried to go back, and I found that it would take me about 2,000 clicks or more um, and a lot of time. So um, I, too, am lazy, like you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, so I have not gone through and actually done an official count. And to be honest, I don't know if Facebook would allow me to go back that far. Uh, but just observationally, it's pretty clear that you know the fall and summer were extremely busy. Um, we're generally having 20-ish hikes a week put up around that time when it's when it's really premium hiking season and then when um the the lazy you know fair weather hikers like myself are not out there in the winter and the mud season um it tends to drop down to you know f anywhere from three to seven i would say a week yeah and it's a great resource for people and um you know, I've been a hiker for a long time. I have some friends that hike that, you know, I knew before I got into hiking, but typically what I say to people is, you know, solo hiking is a reality, and if you wait around for people to hike with, a lot of times, you know, you're never going to be able to go hiking. So it, it is something that I do a lot, but more and more as I get older and softer, I've been, you know, reaching out, and we've, we've been involved in a couple of buddy hikes, uh, but I do think that it's really important for people that aren't comfortable with solo hiking or they're on a, you know, a different learning curve. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, there's resources, and we talk about these. Like, you can use a guide service. Um, you can use a social media group like Hiking Buddies um, to do that. So we always want to highlight that because we just want to make sure that people have options and whatever you're comfortable with, you can, you can, you, know, you can do, you can approach hiking any way you want, but knowing that you have the option of having hundreds and thousands of people that you could potentially hike with is, is a big, um, it's a big message that we want to get out. Yeah. We're not up to hundreds of thousands just yeah. yet, but hundred or thousands. thousands. Yeah. Thou yeah. Hundreds or thousands. Yes. Um, so I would, I would also say, too, that um, I think you guys did uh, an episode that I found really, really interesting where you guys went into the statistics of, you know, the calls in for rescue. And, you know, I think the one that jumped out at me the most is that the outcomes tend to be better when you're with somebody. And it, it reminded me to I have actually gone on winter hikes um, despite um, all the crap that everyone gives me. Yes. And on one of those said hikes, I was on a buddy hike and I was coming down with um, a, one micro spike because the other one broke. Um, and I did slip and I, I, was, I was falling before I knew I was falling. It was one of those, you know, slips on the ice. And my head came down uh, directly on a uh, stump and the stump just gave way. Like my head went right into it, almost like a pillow. It was rotted and disgusting, but my head went into the stump, you know, backwards. And I thought to myself, if I was alone and that stump wasn't rotten, like I'd probably bleed out, you know, on this mountain right now. And we kind of, you know, we joked a little bit about, you know, I'm lucky it was a rotted stump, but that could have been a very different outcome had I been A, by myself, and B, had that stump not been, 
wildly deteriorated at that point. Um, we also had, um, we've had a couple buddy hikes where unfortunately things have happened. Um, and one of them recently, uh, I think it was last winter, um, the woman who was, you know, a good hiker, but she slipped uh, climbing up a rock. She fell, she broke her hip, she slid down into a gully. Um, and, you know, the two hikers that, she, or three hikers she was with, you know, were able to, to, to get her on a rope and keep her from sliding further. But she had no ability to try to grab anything out of her pack because every time she let go of what she was holding on to, she started to slide down the hill further. And I, I thought to myself on that day too, when I got that information, like if she had been alone, she would have been down a gully by herself with a broken hip. And that's just not a good outcome. So we're not, we, we, we don't talk down about solo hiking at all. We definitely see the benefits and why people do it. I've solo hiked before, but you know, just the reality is that if you're a newer hiker, an inexperienced hiker, your odds are better if you're with someone else. Yeah, and I think the data bears that out. So basically, I think for the last, I said basically, but um, for the last four years, I've tracked whether people have been in groups or they've been solo. And I think about 75% of the search and rescue calls that come through the media are um, where people have been in more, you know, one or, more than one person. And 25% are solo hikes. But I do think that it is a reality that like, if, if things go south on a solo hike, it's much more, it can be much more difficult. I think it'd be interesting to see how, I think that from a statistical standpoint, I would expect there to be more calls with group hikes because I think more people hike with someone than, than solo, just from a statistical numbers basis. I, I'm willing to bet that three to four groups go up for every one s single solo hiker. Yep. You know, somebody has someone with them and then obviously the odds that somebody trips is higher when you have four people versus one. But I think I think the the bottom line is from our perspective would be that, you know, if something goes wrong, we want to make sure you get down the mountain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Oliveira, thank you for coming. I know you've come a long way here. You know, a couple hour drive for us. Yep. Yeah. So Not I appreciate you coming. Um, Pleasure to be here. So and I know that it's you know it's real. You've, your family suffered a, a horrible tragedy, and I know that it's it's still relatively recent in your mind. Um, you know, we're, we're excited to be able to participate in Emily's hike. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, you've got this guy here, how did this crazy guy get in touch with you? And can you sort of talk a little bit about, you know, Emily's hike and sort of your thoughts around, um, you know, what, what you want to get out of this event? So I really, what I said in the previous also interview, I was really overwhelmed with the support of people who I did not know. Um, I learned a lot about the hiking community, that it was really an amazing support. This is a person who was not involved in the uh, hiking community. She mm -hmm. was a solo hiker. She started hiking uh, at the end of uh, high school. And as kids went to college, uh, the her hiking buddies dispersed because they were a different on different schedules. Yeah. So I didn't know anything about the hiking buddies or how would people hike together. And when the tragedy happened, as I said, there was an overwhelming support of friends, family, work friends. But I was amazed and speechless with the support of the hiking community. Uh, so when Ben got in touch with me, it was really a pleasure to be part of uh, uh, co-sponsoring Emily's hike. Um, in her memory, we created a, a foundation in her name. Um, this was a highly driven person, but mostly she was a person who wanted to help others. This is the reason why she wanted to get go into the medicine field so that healthcare could become available to everybody. So part of the foundation's uh, funds will go helping search and rescue, who are really amazing, and despite of the treacherous weather, went up every day, despite of the conditions up, they did what they could and uh, to bring her down and to put a closure to that. So that's going to be part of it. The other part, I would like to see ways of helping or creating some uh, brochures about sp certain spots that are very dangerous mm -hmm. in the White Mountains where um, Emily actually made the wrong move and went into the drainages. Um, and uh, the third thing is really sponsoring underprivileged people with some scholarships. And also, uh, when we were volunteering at the, now I, now I was volunteering in the hospital with the Navajo Reservation. She was uh, volunteering with the kids in a charter school. Okay. 
And they're actually doing a hike with the medical director during the summer, kids who have diabetes. So mm -hmm. I would want part of the funds to sponsor those underprivileged kids who are learning to hike and learning to take care of themselves. Excellent. And then you, um, as far as sort of the, the fundraising efforts and the foundation, um, this is recently new. You've set this up. So th this will be the primary fundraiser to, to start For the foundation. This, to start, yes, to start the foundation. And other funds are coming from donations from all over the states, which I was really surprised. As soon as the foundation site went live, we got yeah. donations. So I was yeah. really very impressed, surprised with people all over the country from Connecticut, Rhode Island, that donated. This happened in a week. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think that the feedback that I've heard from people has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and I expect that this fundraiser is going to be pretty big. So it's going to be a lot of work for you, Ben. It's going to be a lot of work for all of us on the organization. It already has been. We've run into some technology issues. So, um, you know, if anyone listening had any problems, please just reach out to us. We'll help you through that. But um, And also the wisdom of the hiking buddies, because I have a lot of people who want to sign up thinking, oh, we're just going to go up the hill. So we're going to try to <laughs> educate people before they just go up the hill about uh, the importance of being prepared for the hike. Um, this is going to be my first hike also. Yep. Uh, so I'm excited about that. So you, you're going to you're going to be participating. I will be participating. Hopefully, I'll make it up yeah, to the top. We'll, so <laughs> we'll hike, make sure it stays safe. So we've got a couple hiking buddies already lined up to help um, Oliveira get to the point where she's ready for the hike that she wants to do. So we've already started working with her on getting some calendar dates circled. Uh, we're going to start small. We're going to start working towards larger goals for her because she really wants to do Lafayette, and we all know Lafayette is not an easy hill to get up. Um, so we have until July 29th to get Oliveira ready. And we've been, we've been pounding the table and telling her like, Hey, we gotta, you know, we gotta get this done and it's going to take some time. So she's been working out and getting herself ready, um, for that, but we've, um, taken her under our wing and we're going to make sure she gets up that hill. Um, and I did want to say also that some of the funds are going to the, um, hiking buddies organization. And one of the the key things that we're very excited about is um, we've partnered um, with Redline Guiding. Um, we haven't started the program yet, but we're, we've, we've lined it all up. It's going to start in the fall. Um, but we're going to be offering uh, certification courses for winter hiking um, primarily, but also just general hiking, um, summer hiking. Um, and we want to um, try to build something for classes for 17 to 25 year olds. So when you think about yourself at 17 to 25, you're invincible, A, and B, there's no way you're gonna spend $150 on a course on hiking. Um, those are two things that um, probably are going to keep you from, you know, as a 20 year old or whatever, spending that kind of money. However, we think if we can ensure that you're gonna be with other peers your age, we can add some fun to it. We can make it free for you by paying from the organization for you to attend. Um, we think we can put enough of a, of a pull and enough of a hook to get young people into um, these training courses and we're hopeful that that will um, ensure better outcomes when they're on the, on the mountains. Yeah, as long as they take one or two important bullet points, which is how to save your life, the importance of hypothermia, yeah. that's a life saved. Yeah, yeah, and it's tough. Like we we talk about this a lot over the course of the hundred episodes. You know, we've talked about, you know, how do you get the message out to people? And the reality is, is that like even the most prepared hiker can get themselves in trouble. The, like the weather can turn very quickly. Situations happen. Um, you know, I've been I've talked about stories about how we've we've dealt with hypothermia when I've been hiking um, with friends, and it just is very difficult to get the message out to everybody. But I think. Um, continuing to get podcasts out, get um, you know groups like the Hiking Buddies involved in getting that message out. I think we're going to talk a little bit with Ty later on about like some ideas around targeting the younger generation. I think like we got to get TikTok, so we got to get TikTok, we got to get hiking <laughs> safety TikTok going somehow. Um, I don't know if I'm the best person to do that, but like Floki can give us a message too. Mel's here with her, with with the the famous cat. So. Um, it is, you know, we do our best, but you can't always account for every situation. And Oliver, I think I, I'd be curious from your perspective, what do you think it was about Emily that attracted her so much to outdoor and, and outdoor adventure and hiking? She was always, growing up, she was an outdoor person. Yeah. Uh, came from a family of uh, 
two physicians who had nothing to do understanding of sports or doing sports. Mm -hmm. We actually wanted her to become athletic, so we pushed the uh, outdoor activities. As soon as she got involved in the outdoor activities, she got really excited. But most excited, which I found really interesting, is that she would go on the hikes, and she would come extremely happy after those hikes. And I don't think it was the really accomplishment of uh, getting a peak. It's just what she would tell me. I would go there, I would ponder on my life, I would come on so, uh, for certain solutions, and I would come back home happy. And she was a very driven college student who had a lot on her plate, wanted to do many, many things. And really, I would always notice that just being outside, being in the nature, which we tend to forget being always on our phones, social media, how that is important for your physical health, but more importantly for your mental health. Yeah, and I think that's true. And we talked about this before is that there is a significant increase. Like there's been some research done with since about 2013, you see a significant increase, especially young women with the level of anxiety that they experience. So I think getting outside um, and resetting. I mean, I, I feel the same way that she she feels around like, you know, getting outside and doing a hike. I feel like I'm completely I mean, it was reset. Really, yeah, it would be interesting. She would come to the resolution of certain conflicts that were really kind of very intense and she would come out fr from the hike and said, I solved it all. Yeah. I know how to deal with it. But I just think like we really tend to forget the importance of social connection. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, so I have to promote that, that yeah. the social connection is the utmost important thing as well as being in the nature and going back to your roots. Yeah, yeah. And, and Ben, I guess the other question that, that um, I would have for you is that, and unfortunately, like we do see, uh, you know, a small number of tragedies every year, you know, t typically, you know, you'll see a handful of, of fatalities um, out there hiking in New Hampshire, which is, it's, it's always difficult. But can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your perspective long term about like education? Um, obviously, I think that, you know, the, this year is to start seeding the foundation, but like, is there any other long term plans? Will this be an annual event, do you think? Yeah, I think we're going to do it as an annual event, um, but we won't do it as a fundraiser every year. So every year there will be an Emily's Hike. Um, how we create that um, will change from year to year, and the reason behind that is, you know, we don't want to burn people out necessarily with all the fundraising, yep. um, but we do want people to participate. Um, this is sort of our um, get off the ground for both the foundation and the Hiking Buddies um, 501c3. So. This year we are doing a fundraiser. Um, everything we have long term will always factor into our mission statement, which is to basically to just try to uh, reduce the avoidable tragedies. And that's when we say avoidable, we always stress that because we do understand and know that you can't avoid all tragedies. They're going to happen. But the ones that are due to being unprepared, um, not having knowledge, um, taking on too much. We feel like those are the, the, the places that we can target and we'll always lean into community for that and com whether that's community impact projects or just connecting people to others so that they're not hiking alone or somebody can say, hey, you're not dressed for this. Like you don't have what you need. We need to turn around, you know, those conversations. Um, we have a lot of, I would say, initiatives that we're building out right now, whether that's, you know, trying to connect to some schools and trying to build out some um, some other programs. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. So if you've noticed anything from us, we try to do things at least as much as we can, a quality job. Um, and so we would rather build those out before we we announce them. But we have um, a lot of I'd say irons in the fire at this point for ways that we're going to try to connect with the community and, and really push um, other education. Um, uh, and you had mentioned a great conversation with Ty Gagne, so I'm just going to plug him while, while oh, he's over there in the corner. But uh, in uh, both May and October, he's going to be participating in roundtables um, um, through Hiking Buddies. Um, the registration is not open yet, but if you're interested in um, you know talking, hearing from Ty and hearing his story and also um, talking about decision making and, um, you know, um, you know, essentially just, you know, tragedy and avoiding it, um, you know, and using sort of his experience um, and his, he's going to be providing some education through an online roundtable. And I'd encourage your listeners to, uh, to register for that in the coming weeks when we open up registration. So 
yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. And we'll plug that on our socials as well. Appreciate it. Great. So, um, Oliveira, Ben, anything else you want to add? I, I would like to just say, too, that um, if you want to participate in Emily Psych, um, you want to go to hikingbuddies.org um, to sign up. Um, we are in need of some leaders for some smaller, slower hikes. So if you fit that bill and you think, I don't want to do a 4,000-footer, and I am also a slower hiker and wouldn't mind having the patience for other slower, newer hikers, um, we certainly would like to hear from you. So if you could reach out to us at info at hikingbuddies.org. We have a number of um, friends and family of Oliveira and her husband who want to hike, and we want to make sure that we provide some some options for folks who haven't necessarily hiked in the past. Um, and we just have also in our community a lot of people who want to participate, but they get um, fearful of the size of the hikes or being left behind, which we're not going to do. This is a charity hike. Nobody's leaving anybody behind. But nonetheless, we don't want to... Um, we want to make sure we have enough options available so that everyone can participate. So um, if you're interested in that, we would love to hear from you. And I would just want to add that, you know, it was a great tragedy that happened, but my hope is that uh, kids her age in that category of 18 to 25 will understand the importance of taking a deep breath before they make the decision. Um, you know, she was a trainee EMT, she knew it all, but she was so driven that she forgot to stop herself. And I think that providing education to that will be also part of the work of the foundation to high schools and colleges of just kind of slowing down, stepping back, taking a deep breath, and making a right decision because the nature gives a lot, but it can take you away in a second. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, I, th I think I speak for probably most of the hiking community to say thank you because a lot of times these tragedies happen and, you know, everybody recognizes that it's, you know, it's a horrible thing that happened, but, like, there's always this feeling of, like, what can we do? And I think that, you know, by offering education and getting the word out, like, this feels like something tangible that, that will come out of this and that we can, we can offer to people. So, and then... One thing I want to give you is, as far as advice goes, if you're sort of getting off the couch and getting into the workout, what I tell what I tell people is like it's more important for you to like you don't need to worry about distance, but you need to worry about consistency. So it's like every day do that like mile walk, and then if you do that for two weeks, then you do a mile and a half for a week. Then you feel like oh I can do two miles, and then you sort of build up over time. But it's the consistency. And not pushing it too far, that is the way to the way to do it. Great. I need that help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Any help I can get up the hill. <laughs> are you are you going with her? Uh, I'm actually um, I set her up with the legend Andrew Barlow. Oh um, so Andrew Barlow will be leading Oliveira's hike. Um, I originally I think we originally were gonna have Oliveira do Liberty, because out of the four on the ridge, we thought that was probably the most doable, and I was coming up Flume and Liberty and planned to meet her at the top. However, plans have changed. Um, we're going to get Oliveira up Lafayette. That's where she wants to be. I understand it 100%. It, it, I, I get it. And um, so Andrew's going to take her up Lafayette. Um, we have a lot of people who are going to be hiking the ridge that day, and we are encouraging any new teams to find other mountains at this point as well. We want to be... Um, make sure we don't overrun it. We already know that there's parking issues there. Um, so I would also make that plug as well. If you're thinking about creating a new team, please um, avoid the ridge. Um, there are other hikes that Emily wanted to finish and whether it's a hike that she needed to finish or not, um, the idea is that we're hiking in her honor and we're just trying to get out there and get the word out. And uh, it doesn't matter what hill, mountain or walk you take. Um, you're in solidarity for what we're trying to accomplish, and we appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I appreciate both of you coming, and thank you so much. And you know, we'll all be there for for Emily's hike. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the most dangerous part is getting out of here. So. So a little housekeeping before we move on to the next segment here. Um, 
A couple sponsors. We have a new one, and we have Ty to talk with us uh, about this one, too. So first one is Bay Slate Coasters. Uh, Bay, State, Bay Slate Coasters create unique, beautiful, functional, and expertly laser-engraved coasters with topographic maps of the 4,000-footers of New Hampshire and more. These coasters are handmade on Cape Cod from slate quarried in the United States and provide a durable and heat-resistant surface for your drinks. Each coaster features intricate detailing of any mountain topography for the location of your choice. Base Lake Coasters will work with you on your custom hand-designed coasters for any street or topographic map. Just Let's just say anywhere on Earth or beyond. Visit baselate.com today to explore a full range of topographic map coasters. Use the code SLASHER10 at checkout for 10% off your first order. And just a reminder, we do have this raffle going on, so there's a ton of stuff here. Um, Mike, if you could just run through that list again. There's some really great stuff. It's valuable stuff, too. A lot of this stuff is like 100 bucks plus, so it's great gear. Um, what we have on the table, uh, to your right on the table, is a QR code. You can just scan that. The donations go to the New Hampshire Outdoor Council, and the raffle at the end uh, will be for all this stuff here. Yeah, so we have uh, EMS Journey trekking poles. We have a um, EMS single camp blanket kit. We have a camp chair, e, uh, an EMS brand camp chair, EMS brand solst solstice sleeping bag, and then we have a single hammock as well, EMS. So it's all good stuff. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we have a brand new sponsor, and this is really exciting. And um, I want to thank Ty for helping us out with this one. But um, we have uh, the Mount Washington Observatory. They're going to start uh, sponsoring the podcast, which is huge news for us. And um, it's officially starting right. next week, but um, figured we'd mention it tonight and um, read this for you. And maybe Ty can comment on that. Sure. Uh, so weather above treeline in the White Mountains is often wildly different than at our trailheads. Before you hike, check the Higher Summits forecast at mountwashington.org. Weather observers working at our nonprofit Mount Washington Observatory write this elevation-based forecast every morning and afternoon. Search and rescue teams, avalanche experts, and backcountry guides all rely on the Higher Summits forecast to anticipate weather conditions above treeline. You should, too. Go to mountwashington.org or text FORECAST to 603 Three five six two one three seven, and the forecast for the rest of the weekend is actually pretty cool. It's like it's still under zero degrees with the wind chill, but um, tonight basically you're looking at clear under partly cloudy skies, and this is of course at six thousand two hundred eighty-eight feet. Uh, but it's a good gauge for higher summits, anything over five thousand feet or so, anything above tree lined. Um, the low is going to be upper single digits. The wind's going to be 40 to 55 miles an hour with gusts up to 70, decreasing to 30 to 45 miles an hour. And again, the wind chill will be 10 below to 20 below. So it's still hardcore winter up there, right? And uh, Sunday night, in the clear, under clear skies, rising, it's going to be balmy. Rising to lower 20s, northwest winds shifting southwest at 20 to 35 miles an hour, rising to 0 to 10 above. And I, I just want to comment also, they have a secondary system, which is called the Mesonet system, which is basically a series of weather stations, these small little, they almost look like little satellites, stationed at different elevations. So from the Higher Summits page, look for the tab for the Mesonet system, and that will give you a rough estimate what the temps are at those different elevations. And again, you can apply those. It's just another tool for your tool bag to find out what's happening at different elevations for your hike. So again, Ty, can you comment on this? This is a really a nice surprise for us. It's, a, it's such a great tool, and we're so happy to be promoting this information to people. We know a lot of our listeners listen on the way up towards the hike. So uh, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you. I serve on the board of trustees of the observatory and it's really great to be at EMS because EMS is the official outfitter of the observatory staff. They're out there 24 seven, 365 collecting weather data um, in all types of conditions on a year round basis, um, providing information to NOAA, providing information to the National Weather Service and to the outdoor community. As you said, it's an elevation-based forecast really focused above treeline. And 
we thought it made complete sense. We we've never sponsored a podcast before, so yeah. but it made total sense recognizing that your subscribers are often listening to your episodes while they're driving to the mountains. Right. Um, yeah, and just perfect. another opportunity for us to raise awareness about the work being done there. I mean, we have our Seek the Peak event coming up on July 15th. If you go to seekthepeak.org, it's our biggest fundraiser of the year. And, and the observatory is a nonprofit organization. Uh, and it's a really exciting time to be part of the organization. We have new leadership with Drew Bush coming on as executive director. And the energy and the commitment of the staff is like super inspiring. So as a board member, you want to do more to support their work uh, oh, because sure. it's so important. So it's really great to be partnering with you and again to be here at EMS doing this. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah, it's excellent. And I'm wondering, um, right now the situ the cat situation up there, there's one cat, right? Yeah, Nimbus. All right. Is, Nimbus. is there any talk about getting additional cats? I you know, I'm not, that's a strategic level decision okay. that uh, I'm not, but okay. we're all super passionate about Nimbus. So. I'm wondering if we could ever get Daphne and Floki up there to, to meet Nimbus. That would be, oh, she's not. Oh, she's such a cat. <laughs> yeah, and we'd, we'd um, at some point love to get one of our weather observers on with you to talk about how yeah. that Higher Summits forecast is built and a little bit more about programming like Science in the Mountains, which is yeah. a free monthly offering and uh, we're doing science in the classroom and um, partnering with schools throughout New Hampshire and beyond um, to to get kids aware of the weather and the impact of the weather and and how we all contribute to to that. Yeah, and one other point about this forecast, they wanted me to stress that you know you you can look at the brief little summary, the succinct summary, but it's really important to read the full discussion because there are potential other scenarios that could play out and they do discuss that oftentimes within that discussion so be sure to uh, check out that larger area as well plenty of information so yeah totally don't base your decision on that current conditions that you see when you go on the website yeah really do the homework and, and dive into that um, forecast discussion I, agree. I totally agree yeah for sure yeah, and it's tricky, too, because you have to make decisions on the ground. Like like a couple of weeks ago, the forecast, I went up to Mount Washington, and the forecast said in and out of the clouds should be breaking, you know, late morning. And it actually turned out to be the case. But when we got to Lakes of the Cloud, it was like basically just white out for the initial stages. So we were kind of sitting there, and we waited like maybe about 20 minutes. We started to see the clouds come through, or the, the sun come through the clouds. And we were like, yeah, this is go. But if we did, if we had a forecast that said like you know they're going to be socked in or in the clouds all day, like we probably would have said like okay now it's time to turn around. Yeah. So, you know you do need to make those on the ground decisions. But like the higher summits forecast will give you sort of you know validation for what you're seeing when you're on the ground. Yeah, and I think it's also looking at it with taking a longer view. Maybe the weather window is going to be really favorable for your day hike. Yeah. But what happens if something goes wrong? And maybe tomorrow's forecast, as part of that forecast discussion, um, isn't so good. Yeah. Do you have the gear that um, that can help you shelter in place until you can get out? Yeah, exactly. Look at that. Like you know, you look if you're hiking in the morning, you want to look and see what's going on in the evening Absolutely. to say like, okay, if things go south, am I gonna? Is it gonna be worse or or better? Right. So, excellent. So very exciting stop. We'll have to get somebody on, and um, you know, we'll Absolutely. have to dig really dig into that cat situation up there. Yep. And I, I mean, you're a formidable interviewer. You just did a complete forecast for the weekend. So <laughs> yeah. I, I hopefully they won't come in intimidated. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we get Nobby here. We're going to talk to him in a sec, Ty. But I guess I wanted to get your perspective. And uh, Stomp, you've been talking about this, but experiential yeah. learning and sort of how do you get the message out to different age groups? Can you just give your perspective? I mean, we just heard from um, Oliveira and, uh, and Ben around trying to get some education out there, particularly in that 17 to 25 year old age group group. Uh, any thoughts on, on what we can do? Yeah, we know from the science, the frontal cortex is still developing at that age. And um, even before that, I just, you know, Oliveira and her family could have turned inward after Emily's death. And um, I think everyone would have understood that. But uh, to see what Oliveira and her family are doing um, and the energy they are focusing on trying to prevent these things from happening and educating people, I, I think is so admirable. And and really happy to be supporting her effort. Um, and again, I think there's we can't do enough to to support them because look look at what they're doing. It's really yeah. really inspirational. Um, 
as you said, I think social media is a really important component, but it's not the only one. I think, yes, um, that's how we're um, taking in content, but it's that's not enough. I think the experiential part of this, the workshops that Ben talked about are important, the certifications are important, but I think it goes beyond that. Uh, just because you get a driver's license doesn't mean you're ready to drive in all conditions, and we see that <laughs> often with new drivers. Yeah. You get a certification for something, or you take a three-day workshop, that doesn't make you an expert. I think learning is a continuing, continuous process, and how do we stress to that group um, that there's still wisdom to be gained, there's mentors out there to help help us lead the way and, mm -hmm. and develop the experience that we need to, to make those good decisions out there. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. What do you think, Stomp? Did you check out? It's a challenge. Is, no, like, I'm not. Uh, no, okay. no, I'm just, I, I want to let him talk. I'm a little distracted over here with all this stuff, but oh, uh, yeah, it's 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 a big topic that we're discussing within search and rescue as well. Not only in terms of prevention, but in terms of uh, membership drives for search and rescue teams, how to reach people of the younger generation. So we'll be talking a lot more about it as we go along. But yeah, and the reality is, is when you look at the data. Um, 29 and under, like they make up the biggest age group of people that do get involved in search and rescue missions. So, you know, we've got to we've got to figure out a way to get the message out to them. And I don't know if it's more enhancements at the trailhead, or um, you know what we can do. But um, you know, I well, do. I yeah. would like to see like a, a New Hampshire specific TikTok expert that focuses on hiking safety. So if you know anybody, <laughs> go for it. We'll have them on. Yeah, I mean, I, you mentioned social media, but I mean this. This younger generation, they love short, brief, succinct videos and get right to the point. Uh, that's one method, but I think it's multifactorial. You have to approach it from so many dif different angles. And and I've spoken to some of the members of Hiking Buddies, and I mentioned this at the last uh, event, the Full Conditions event at Reckless, that um, the trailhead is the first line of defense. If you're seeing somebody, don't just walk past them and skip it. Try to make a way to say, hey, where you going? If they look unprepared or woefully unready for the conditions, don't let that opportunity pass. That's the front line, right on the trail. Yeah, yep. and I think as Ben said, and I don't want to generalize or label a particular age group, uh, yeah. but there is that feeling of immortality um, that comes through wisdom and experience. And I think, how do you break through that? How do you mm -hmm. have people understand that you are vulnerable? These are unpredictable environments. Um, yeah, you've gone out. For a few hikes but that doesn't again make you an expert yeah. um and but i think it spans all age groups because we've seen even the most experienced run into trouble sure yep so a lot of a lot of things to think about so um i guess last segment here we've got our friend nobby Are you ready oh you got you're gonna do another thing here another thing. <laughs> all right all right all right <laughs> slashers hiking topic of the week There's so many switches there. I don't even know what that stuff does. It's so fascinating to me. Sweet Beginnings Day Care is a New Hampshire state licensed child care provider that offers care for children from six weeks to 12 years with flexibility in before and after school care as well. Sweet Beginnings aims to instill a love for learning by providing a safe and positive experience within a loving and warm environment. Sweet Beginnings believes this is a good foundation to teach children in order to prepare them for their future. For more information, contact Sweet Beginnings at 603-568-4530, visit them at Sweet Beginnings Daycare on Facebook, or email Shandy at shandyelliot at outlook.com. Just to kick this off, so we have our friend Nobby, so um, um, Mark Lindeberg, Nobby Hikes, he has a YouTube channel, um, somehow him and uh, my recollection is somehow him and Stomp met each other in the middle of a Pemi loop, and they were both like really not doing well, and they like they yeah. they formed an alliance or something, and then like <laughs> saved each he other. Can tell you the story. No, we we, we were just uh, meeting at the parking lot, and uh, it was kind of funny because uh, we're like the only ones in the parking lot, and uh, so we start the Pemi, and uh, there's no snow anywhere, and we start going up, and we're talking, and uh, uh, we're like. What are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm thinking about doing a Pemi in a two day, and maybe maybe starting at a, I'll be able to camp out at Garfield, and uh, he's like, well, I'm doing a uh, Pemi in a day, and you know, I'm like, 
you know, Mr. Macho. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that sounds good. I'll, I'll do it with you. <laughs> and uh, so we started doing it, and we get we get to altitude, and uh, pretty much, I think I have PTSD from the post holing. It was <laughs> it was it was absolutely amazing. I have a great yeah. profile picture of me with my whole leg sunken in. <clears throat> I look really cool, but my whole leg sunken in, and I'm really hurting. And uh, so I, we went through this abusive day together, and uh, and after that, we I, I got to Garfield, and I'm like, um, listen, um, I'm about to die right now. I, I can't go on. <laughs> and uh, he's like, okay. And so he, he he went on, and I just camped out there for the night. Um, but What's, what time of the year was this stop? Right now. Yeah. This was right. Yeah, now. it was it was our right. first whole yeah. city. Did, did you actually go so from brutal. Garfield over to like Skookumchuck in that area? You made it through yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, oh, I that's finished. Brutal. I finished, but that's brutal. yeah, I, yeah. I remember that that night I stayed at Garfield, and the wind was so bad because it was a storm coming in, and uh, I think the next day um, there was a storm coming in, so I just I just went down to uh, Thirteen Falls and, and just went straight back to the. Uh, the visitor center there. Got it. So you guys um, met on in the parking lot, yeah, and yeah. we've been stuck with. I mean, you we've been friends with you ever since. <laughs> um, so we've been basically um, hiking with with Nobby for a while. So yeah. I hiked with Nobby today. So I have a couple of no I took notes. Okay. On things oh, that he did. Here we so go. we're here to talk about Lyme disease. So you just recovered from like um, a, a bout of it. Like it sounds like you've had it multiple times, right? Yeah. I yeah, yeah. And I I feel kind of silly saying that um, because you know I'll be the first one to tell you that you need to check after a hike. Uh, but uh, I think back in uh, I, I work outside and I also am a big mountain biker, so I'm I'm always outside and uh, and I think I first got it when I was uh, in the early '90s, I think. Right. And uh, and when I first got it, um, there was the testing wasn't very good, and my father-in-law at the time was a doctor, and he was like, "Well, I think you just go on the antibiotic, and we'll see if that if that does anything." And it worked, and it, and I, I felt great after that. And uh, so since then, um, I, I've had a couple other incidences, but every time I'd, I'd have uh, I get sick. Um, I would I would go on to the antibiotic and within like a day I, I felt fine and, and it really really worked. But there's different types of Lyme's disease which which I'll be talking about that uh, that's kind of yeah. Well, hold on that yeah. for a second. But yeah. um, so you just had a bout that you had arthritis and things like that. But so Stomp yes. was telling me he's like Nobby's not doing good and all this stuff. So I thought mm. he's gonna be a little slow today because he just got back into hiking. But um, I, was, I was like I was observing slow. him like he. I was slow. You were not slow. You were like going too fast. He was like way up ahead I was of waiting. everyone. I, was yeah. I don't know what this lime, this tick was that bit you. Well. But like Ty, I feel like if you if you're looking for a writing project, you should probably like do a comic no. book about like super lime man no. No, no, because no. like it's like Peter Parker except he got bit by a by no. a tick. I think listening to you, I'm more concerned about your road race. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Just, yeah. That yeah. might be a problem too. Yeah. But like the, he was like since, hiking super fast. Since you destroyed me on the flume slide, well, I, I did I, do that. I, uh, I I've been training. That. Yeah. So, but I was like expecting a little bit less. Be, but I was impressed with how fast Thank you. you were going. Thank oh, you. Crazy. But like he didn't wait for us. Like, he, Whoa. When you're, he was in the front of the, the hike. He <laughs> didn't look back at all. No, I like, was. I was. Like, I, was. Back. I, I was, was taking pictures, and you didn't stop. You kept going. Well, I wanted to give you space. He had did a chip you take on his any shoulder. pictures today, though? Yes, I did. Yeah, but you didn't take any of me, did you? Um. <laughs> he didn't take any pictures. Like that's another thing. Like you have to have an equal we amount of pictures <laughs> when you're we, hiking with somebody. We have some nice profile pictures that that, that you can use. Okay. Of, of both of us together on the top of the the off to you. Okay. Well, I was watching you. you like a hawk, and I was like, this guy doesn't have lime. I don't know what's going on here. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so let's start this off with some tick jokes. So are, uh, you, are you saying the tick jokes or are you doing them? I don't know. I, maybe I I'll gave try up it this on time. that. I'll try it this I'm time. I'm not clean very, and sober. I'm not oh, very God. good. No more tick I'm, jokes. I'm the worst joke. This is typically Stomp's move, but go ahead. What do you get when you cross a tick in a mountaineer? A mountain climber who's always itching for a challenge. But I'm bummed. Hey, Stomp, come on. Hey, I only where, have two where, channels the over here. Where's the fill in? <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, next. All right. Keep hey, it I hope coronavirus <laughs> issue gets resolved. This is really timely here. This <laughs> I hope coronavirus issue gets uh, resolved uh, before the uh, tick season 
or else we're going to have Corona with Lyme. Yeah. Zinga. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I don't even know. I feel yeah. like that can get us canceled. I apologize. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, um, so your your most recent bout, you you felt our arthritis symptoms, well, right? Yeah, I mean, like like I said before, um, I would generally have a fogginess, and and it's really funny because you have a fogginess, and it kind of um, affects you mentally. And I would be out of work, um, so too foggy to even go to work, and then and then it would occur to me that maybe I have Lyme again. And uh, then I then I would I would uh, get it fixed, and usually it's a, a three or four week um, thing of taking antibiotics, and, and but but usually it cured me up within like a day, really fast. So I don't know if that was a. Uh, yeah. um, well, I think the difference too is that you're not you're more of a backpacker overnight person too, so you're probably more apt to get. Um, ticks on you, right? Yes, yes. And, and, and I've done a lot of, well, you know all the, uh, the crazy trails yes. I've done. Um, I've done a lot of trails that no one even hikes. And, and you're basically just going through brush the whole, the whole way. And, uh, and a lot of times I couldn't even find the trail when I was doing uh, that, that the, you know, when I was doing the, the new, new, in New Hampshire, doing yeah. the uh, Coloss. Coloss Trail. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was a tough trail because uh, there was nobody on it and a lot of the trails were overgrown and and that's the worst thing when you're when you're going through a, a, a foot or two feet of of grass that's where all the ticks are mm-hmm. especially if there's animals in the area like deer or a lot of mice and stuff like that um you're 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 gonna get it um and and no canopy that's another yeah. factor too yeah it's it's uh but um if i can uh if I can tell everybody, I mean, just just be very, very, very careful. And uh, when you when you sometimes you can't help it, uh, but to go through the stuff like like me going on the uh, the cohos. But um, every night I was careful with with uh, running my hands around, trying to to feel because uh, you can't see them a lot of times. A lot of times they're so small that you it takes your hand going across your leg to feel a little bump right there, and you'll be like, oh yeah, that's a tick. Um, so it, it's it's uh, it's not anything you should be scared of. It's just something that you just need to learn to. Uh, that's part of everyday life thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you actually like? Do you, is your is your situation like? Oh, I found a tick bite. Now I need to go to the doctor and get it checked on. No, or do you it, go by the symptoms. It takes a while. Like so, if you find a tick and you're like, well, I just went hiking uh, maybe like 24 hours ago. As long as you get it off, you're good. But if it's on you for like 36 to 48 hours. Um, you're gonna have a problem, right. but mm-hmm. not but not not every tick is infected. So you know it's it's like a you're spinning the roulette wheel here. It's you're trying to so you you don't know. All mm-hmm. right. Well, stomp. What is your what are your tricks for prevention? What do you what do you what do you recommend? I I had mentioned canopy. I avoid grassy areas oh, with yeah. open canopy. Um, if it means you know skirting into the woods, this is in particular with uh, bushwhacking. Um, I like to wear those cargo pants with the zippers at the knees um, because there's, there tends to be a little fold that captures those little buggers. So they like to go one direction. They can't. They don't have a reverse, I guess. So they'll go up. They'll get stuck. Um, there are some taping strategies, and of course, um, you know, the sprays. There, there are multiple sprays you can use: permethrin, DEET. Uh, there are some holistic options that are out there as well. Um, but it's just knowing where they are, and and it, it really comes down to those two areas, you know, just grassy areas and open canopy. Yeah, and I actually so a couple of things that I I tend to do is I look for rocky trails actually in the summer a lot of times. Like if yeah. I'm jumping rock to rock, like typically yeah. they're not on those types of trails. Um, the other thing is I'll take a look at where I'm putting my backpack down. Like I don't put my backpack down anywhere, but like except on rocks. Sure. I feel like like ticks don't go near rocks. I don't know why I think that, but I feel like that's a good thing. And then permethrin, I think I used to wear the ankle socks, but now I wear like higher socks. So yeah. I think if you if you if you treat your socks with the permethrin, and then. Um, you know, just consistently wear those. That's a good way to mm. avoid them as well. Yeah, uh, Grandma, Grandpa Stomper over here. Their their trick is to use a lint roller yep, at lint the end roller. of a hike. Just roll it up and down your body, and it might pick up one of the smaller deer ticks. Yep, and then you should have somebody check all your like Mrs. Stomp checks all your nooks and crannies. <laughs> <afterwards>. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> places where the sun don't yeah, shine. Yeah, I wouldn't want that job. But, uh, <laughs> but God bless her for that. So, um, but yeah, that is definitely like it's something that people need to keep in mind. And um, yeah, you don't want to get bit by a tick for yeah, sure. No, no doubt. Well, so, Nobby, we're glad that you're doing well. Yeah, no, it, it was tough because uh, th- this time was different. Um, this time, and, and I'm, I was a little upset because uh, this time my, my whole knee got all inflamed. And when my knee got inflamed, I, I thought it was uh, you know, a hiking accident. And so I went to the doctor, and I, even, I went to uh, even an orthopedic doctor, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's overuse. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, all right, overuse. And then so I tried to maybe do a little PT on it to try to, uh, but that just made it worse. The PT made it worse. And, and I, I couldn't walk the next day if I did PT on it. And so then I went back and, I was, and he said, all right, well, let's do, give you a, a blood test. And so I, I got a blood test. And when I first got Lyme's disease, the blood tests really were terrible. And, but now, the, 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 I went back to the doctor, and the doctor was like, uh, yeah, it looks like you uh, probably, I, I was looking at the blood test, it looks like you got it in between this date and this date. And I'm like, well, I did do a training hike between those two dates. And so I'm thinking it's, it's absolutely amazing that she, she knew that from my blood test. Hmm. So it, they are getting a lot better. And she said, yes, you, you, you do have Lyme, so we're going to put you on, on uh, antibiotic. But this time it was different. Um, it didn't go right away. Like, like but before when I had it, like the foggy head, it, it, it went away right away and I was fine. But this time um, it was a lot slower. And so it, I think it probably, since I took the, the three, after I took the, the three weeks of uh, antibiotics, I think it took my knee something like eight more weeks to, to gain, uh, to, gain to, 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 to shrink and, and not to be inflamed. And uh, so I, I, after, so after the three weeks, I, I called up and I said, I think I need another, I think another dose. And the doctors were like, No, no, you, you don't. You just need to, you know, be you, wait, be patient. So I was patient, and I, I admit I was wrong. I, I thought that I was for sure. I thought I still had was in, you know, had the stuff in my knee. But um, after about eight weeks. It went away, and right now I, I can barely feel it now. So I'm very, very thankful because you know you you get to a point where you know I was limping for 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 uh, for months, limping for months, and I didn't even know if I was going to be able to hike ever again. And uh, and hmm. it's funny, uh, I have a, a new dog that that has been uh, uh, Knox that I'm sure you'll meet if you see my videos, and uh, he's been hiking with me, and he he's he's only one. And uh, he's, re- he's he's really really good. And uh, it's the funny thing about it is, since I was doing all this limping around at home and at work and stuff like that, I'm sitting on the the couch one day and he, I notice a dog walks by and he's limping, and I'm like, huh. sympathy, like, yeah yeah something something his left leg. And I'm like, I look at his paw and, and I look at his pads and stuff and it's fine. And and then about an hour later, I look over and he walks by again and it's and he's limping on his right leg and i'm like what's going on here and i think that was it's, I, yeah, I don't know. it was a sympathy yeah. limp. it was a sympathy limp yeah. the dog's smart yeah. he's like mimicking his owner yeah so that's, that's amazing a, that yeah. is interesting <laughs> don't take that dog hiking because that dog's gonna like tap out and you're gonna have to carry oh, it no, off no, no, it's no, gonna no, be no, fine no no, 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 no you, 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 you need to meet knox there's no way he's tapping out uh, he, he's a tough dog yeah. Did you get the ring around the, the bite? The bullseye? Um, this time, I, I didn't even see it. Huh. I, I, I've had the ring before. One, one time I had it like even like right behind my arm where I can't even see it. And uh, my girlfriend was like, uh, what's that on your arm? And I'm like, I don't see anything. And, um, and it, it was really, really painful. I thought it was maybe just like a, a pimple or something. But uh, that, that it, 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 and, the, and the, the bullseye really hurts. Yeah. It, it hurts for a while. So, well. well. Um, we are. But, we're glad that you're back at it. Yeah, I am too. Love I, I uh, I'm feel, I'm feeling good, and uh, hopefully this year we'll be able to do some, uh, some, some, some big hikes. Yeah, we'll get out there. We'll get yeah. out there. We'll do that Pemi loop for you. But thanks, Snobby, for thanks, Snobby, for, for joining us. Better. Hey, so. hey, congratulations, guys. One hundred. 
Hey man, thank yeah, you baby. very much. Yeah, <laughs> and check out. No we'll link in Nobby's. Um, we'll link Nobby's YouTube channel. There's a couple of videos with Stomp in there. I think I'm in a couple of them too. So. Um, yeah, we always have a good time. Yeah, really well produced. So, well, we're getting the final tickets ready. Any questions? Anybody got any Q&A they want to ask Stomp or Ty or or me or Nobby? Anybody? I think they're exhausted. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Thanks for standing with us for the last few hours. Appreciate it. I mean, 150 yeah. people here. That's impressive. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Actually, 200. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. What do we say? We want to wrap up and then we can do the raffle? Um, yeah, offline? let's do it offline, I guess. All right. Well, thanks for listening to 100 of these dumb shows. And uh, we'll announce these on the socials. I think yeah. that's probably a good idea. Yeah, that works. And congratulations to both of you again. Congratulations, awesome. guys. All right. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thanks. Let's do another 100. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S L A S R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fishing game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots, and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Nealon from New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared. I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.